Good evening, everybody. Um, thank you all for registering. And on behalf of the Cambridge University Baha'i Society, I welcome you to the second of eight talks by eight international speakers. Um, your microphones and cameras have all been um, turned off for the duration of the talk. My name is Catherine. I'm a member of the Cambridge Baha'i community and in collaboration with the Cambridge University um, Baha'i Society, these eight talks have been organized to commemorate the centenary of the passing of Abdul Baha, which was on 27th of November 1921. For some, this is the first time you are learning about Abdul Baha, and maybe it was the topic of the talk that intrigued you. For others, you may wish to gain a, just a greater understanding of Abdul Baha. So I would just like to share a little bit about Abdul Baha. After the passing of his father, Baha'u'llah, the founder of the Baha'i faith, Abdul Baha devoted his ministry to furthering his father's faith and to promoting the ideals of peace and unity. As well as being a prisoner for over 40 years, he was also knighted by the British for his humanitarian work during the First World War. But this is simplifying his life his life, his significance and achievements, not only to the new religion, but also his significance to us today and the world today, hence the, these talks. Each speaker as an academic has researched their interest in the work, teachings and life of Abdul Baha, and the talks cover diverse subjects. I'm personally grateful for the time each speaker is giving to share their work and insights. The talk will be approximately 45 minutes. It is being recorded. There will be time at the end to answer your questions. Please write them in the chat. All talks um, will be um, shared on the Baha'i Society YouTube channel. Any questions after the talk, you can also email the um, Baha'i Society and the email address will, be, will appear on the final slide after the talk, a few days later, you will receive a follow-up email with a list of the other talks. You are very welcome, and we encourage you to share this list and also register yourself for the other talks, because this, we feel, is a very unique opportunity. Also, the email address for the Baha'i Society will be shared in case you have any further questions. I would now like to welcome our speaker, Amin Egahi. I asked for her pronunciation, and I mean, did his very best to coach me in the pronunciation of his last word, name. I mean, he's speaking to us today from Barcelona, where he lives and works. I mean, holds a PhD in modern and contemporary history from the Universitat Autonoma de Barcelona. He's the author of various works on the life and teachings of Abdul Baha. And this evening, the topic is human nature. I will now hand over to Amin. Thank you, Amin. Thank you very much. Good evening to all of you. It is my pleasure to be with you in this meeting as part of this uh, wonderful program of conferences, online conferences that has been arranged. Uh, <clears throat> one of the most outstanding, from my very humble point of view, most outstanding chapters in the life of Abdul Baha is uh, his travels, the period of his travels to the West. And this is for several reasons, among them, and to me, the most important of the reasons, uh, because on that three-year period, he had the opportunity to share uh, with all his audiences in the West some of the teachings of his father regarding the future of mankind, uh, regarding the the regarding peace human equality and also regarding human nature and it is very significant that he delivered his message in the way he did at the time he did because when he visited the west uh, both north america and europe were immersed in a series of uh, conceptual frameworks that were completely opposite to what were his proposals for the future of mankind and to what was his definition on human nature. 
one of the one of the features of the conceptual framework at that time on the definition of human beings of humanity at that time was the belief very much backed by science at the time was the belief in uh, biological determinism at that time it was believed that anything that we consider today as a human feature or intelligence or Im imagination or arts or religious feelings or emotions or morals ethics absolutely everything is determined by our body by our natural constitution by our physical constitution and this was a belief which was as i mentioned before was uh, shared by many at the time by a ma the majority of intellectuals at the time and which was also advocated by the science of the time and close to this belief in biological determination there was the belief that it is possible to categorize humans according to their physical fitness uh, remember that i say that everything was considered to have a physical source intelligence uh, emotions everything so <clears throat> At the time, it was common to propose uh, the categorization not only of individuals according to their natural capacities, to the supposed natural capacities, but also of, of whole segments of mankind. Mankind was divided among in races, it was divided among nations, and it was divided between men and women. And a whole hier hierarchy of uh, a whole series of levels were uh, standardized by the science of the time, uh, trying to show to public opinion the fitness of some human collectives and the unfitness of others, the superiority of some members of the human race and the inferiority of others. Then close to this belief in biological determination and this belief in the possibility of leveling all humans in different categories close to them was the belief that there is it is possible to arrange society uh, according to this criteria since it was believed that some humans are superior to others it was proposed to accept social segregation as a natural um, mechanism towards the protection of what we consider the superior humans. So in countries like the, in the, like the United States, laws were implemented uh, trying to separate, to segregate whites from other races, especially from Afro-Americans and from Asians. And these measures were taken, uh, were taken after the belief, because people at that time believed that the mixture of members of superior races, of superior human groups, with member of, members of inferior human groups would bring un, unwilled results. Let me show you some examples of this. Um, of what I'm trying to explain to you. Moved by this belief that it is possible to categorize humans according to their biological constitution, at the time of the travels of Abdul Baha, soon before, just in the, in, the, in the one or two decades before the travels of Abdul Baha to the West, some pseudosciences started to be implemented. One of them was, for instance, craniometry. Another was uh, physiognomy. And it was believed that taking measures of the, of the human skull or taking uh, measures of some physical features in the face, for instance, the brows, the eyes, the nose, uh, this could reveal some particular human features that had very much to do with our emotions and our psychology. Uh, one of the pioneers of these pseudosciences 
was Cesare Lambroso, who was an Italian scientist. And he, for instance, in one of his very well-known works, he wrote, for instance, on one occasion, we have already spoken of the abundance of precocity of wrinkles in born criminals. They are also a characteristic of the insane. The following are of special importance. The vertical and horizontal lines of the forehead, the oblique and triangular lines of the brows, the horizontal and circumflex lines at the root of the nose, and the vertical and horizontal lines of the neck on the neck. So here's just one of the many instances, many examples I could give you of the kind of scientific statements that were given at that time. If you have any kind of those wrinkles, maybe according to Lambroso, maybe you are either a criminal or an insane. Um, and really uh, about from these ideas, from these scientific beliefs, a whole series of techniques uh, were started trying to measure any aspect of human identity uh, from physical features. This belief in the superiority of some human groups over, over others prompted Charles Darwin to write uh, in one of his works, at some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. When we, when we go back to the 19th century history and we study and we learn about imperialism and colonialism and the different policies that the European and American powers enacted at that time, we cannot isolate them from these kind of beliefs. Uh, they are the result of a firm belief in the superiority of some human groups over others and in their right to replace and exterminate the inferior ones. Herbert Spencer, who was one of the most influential philosophers at the time, he was the father of uh, social Darwinism, he took all the ideas that Charles Darwin applied to, uh, to biological evolution. He applied them, he projected them to human evolution, to social evolution. And he at what time wrote, the forces which are working out the great scam of perfect happiness exterminate such sections of mankind as stand in the way with the same sternness that they exterminate beasts of prey and herds of useless animals. Again, I have, I have to repeat that Herbert Spencer was the most influential philosopher in the English speak, speaking world at the time, at the turn of the 20th century, the beginning of the 20th century. And these kind of ideas, which again, they were backed by the science of the moment, this kind of ideas very much influenced the, the external policies of many countries, but also their domestic policies. As I mentioned before, policies such as the Jim, Jim Crow laws in the United States that allowed um, racial segregation. With uh, this, <clears throat> this is one example of what I was saying at the beginning of this presentation regarding the belief in biological determination. This is a chart uh, which was presented during the first Universal Races Congress, which was held in London in 1911, in the summer of 1911, July 1911. And this was presented by the scholar John Gray, a British scholar. And in this chart, in this chart, he wanted to present, he was attempting to present a classification of different nations of the world according to their natural intellectual capacity. I mean, can I just interrupt? Um, yes. We're not seeing your slides. You are not seeing any no. of the slides? Sorry. Oh. Did you press share screen? Uh, 
Now you see it? Yes. I could, yes, perfect. Sorry, yes, I, go, yes, so perfect. I, will, I go back. This is the quotation from Charles Thank Darwin. You. At some future period, not very distant as measured by centuries, the civilized races of man will almost certainly exterminate and replace throughout the world the savage races. This was the quotation, this was the quotation from Heather Spencer. And this was the chart, the chart I was trying to show you. Uh, as you can see here, John Gray was proposing a method of classifying the different nations, some of the nations of the world, according to a supposed uh, natural intellectual capacity, right? So at the top of his chart, he, uh, he, put it, he, he placed the United States at the last, in the last, uh, last position in the chart, he placed the Afro-Americans. And then he basically classified other countries according to supposed natural capacity. Now, let me clarify something which is very important. At that time, nation and race were considered to be the same thing. There was no distinction. So what one, what one could say, the um, Portuguese race or the Portuguese nation was considered to be the same thing. It was the belief of that time that each nation is the result of a series of biological mixtures between races over the history of over the history. Uh, for instance, um, Spain was considered to be a race with some Arabic influence, some Middle East influence as well, North African influence, Middle East influence, uh, but also with some German influence as well because of the different invasions that it suffered over its history. So at that time, nation and race were considered the same thing. Of course, a group of nations could be seen as sub races of a major racial group, but this chart is, a, is the best summary of what I was trying to share with you. This belief that everything in, in, in human identity uh, depends on our bio biological nature. This chart classifying mankind according to a supposed natural intellectual capacity. And it is interesting that this chart was presented, this chart was presented at the first Universal Races Congress in London, which was aimed to establish bridges of friendship between peoples of different races. But in a Congress as that, some scientists dared to present again all these ideas about racial and biological inequality. This belief in the importance of race in determining our nature or identity as human, as humans was even shared by uh, advocates of the civil rights of the black population in North America. This is uh, Mr. Dubois, who was one of the most outstanding uh, leaders of the, of the Afro-Americans in the United States. And at some point in his writings, he wrote, in our calmer moments, we must acknowledge that the human beings are divided into races. The history of the world is the history not of individuals, but of groups, not of nations, but of races. And he who ignores or seeks to override the race idea in human history, ignores and overrides the central thought of all history. There can be no doubt as to its efficiency as the vastest and most ingenious invention of human progress. So again, we see a person uh, who represents a human group that has been oppressed on account of their race, defending that human history is determined by race and that we cannot read human progress or the world history without referring to a biological 
feature of mankind, which is race. And even among the suffragists, uh, there was this firm belief in biological determination and particularly in racial determination. For instance, uh, the first quotation is from a suffragette, Mary Scarlett. She writes, the race will be whatever the woman of the race make it. And she defended that women should be freed and should be able to participate in politics in order to implement policies that would allow women to uh, better benefit their race. And then the second quotation is from Marie Corelli. She, she was a very popular writer at the time, and she was an anti-suffragist. And she defends the opposite position on the same racial ba basis. The anti-suffrage woman has a great task before her in endeavoring to raise the standard of women in social and public matters, and in helping the mothers of the race to realize their great privilege of training their sons and daughters to be worthy citizens, citizens of our country. So you see everything, absolutely everything, uh, was instilled with this belief in biological determination, which was uh, which was expressed uh, in different ways. Even in the peace movement, uh, there was this belief. Uh, sorry, somebody is saying that they can they can't see my video. There's no presentation now. I'm so sorry. We we don't see your. There okay, we okay, go. There yeah. you are. Okay. Okay. Thank. You. So even inside the peace movement, leaders of the peace mo movement like Andrew Carnegie, who made Abdul Baha, David Starr Jordan, who made Abdul Baha, they are well also in very much influenced with this belief of biological determination. For instance, uh, in their proposal for peace, they advocated for the for the members of the Teutonic races, that is the Germans, the French, the British, and white North Americans to unitedly govern the whole world. That was one of the proposals for the establishment of peace uh, in the world. And Andrew Carnegie, uh, he, there's a quotation I have used in some of, of, in a recent article, which is in the internet, Andrew Carnegie was sure that it was impossible for the United States and Germany to enter into a war because he wondered himself, how can there be a, a war between Germany and the United States? We are all members of the same Teutonic race. So they were convinced of this, uh, of this um, possibility of categorizing human beings among in different classes, depending on the race or the biological features. Not only this, a fourth feature of the definition of human nature at that time uh, was that together with this belief in biological determinism, this belief in the possibility of categorizing human beings and, into, and, and considering human beings superior or inferior, and this belief in implementing social measures to guarantee uh, the superiority of some human beings above others and guaranteeing the purity of some, the racial purity of, purity of some human groups over others. There was together with all this, there was the belief in competition as the source of progress. Um, as I mentioned before, Social Darwinism uh, was very influence, very influential at the time. Um, science also uh, backed some of the theories of social Darwinism. And it was believed that through that through war and through competition between human groups, progress can be achieved. So this was a this was a fourth feature very much uh, agreed at the time, very much accepted by public opinion, and what is worse, very much accepted by the political, political leaders at the time. 
And for some, war was perceived, was seen as a natural impulse of some human groups to govern and exterminate others which are inferior. And war was simply justified as a biological necessity and as part of human nature, just as among animals there is competition and there is a strife, people at that time believed the conceptual, the predominant, predominant conceptual framework at that time uh, believed that uh, conflict and uh, division and competition cannot be detached from human nature, cannot be separated from, from human nature. So this were basically, this was basically the, the main features of the conceptual framework at that time in what regards uh, human nature. And, and I have very briefly enumerated some of the social consequences that that conceptual framework had racial segregation, uh, eugenics, I haven't mentioned, the appearance of eugenics. When Abdul Baha was visiting the United States, the very first uh, World Congress on eugenics was held in Europe. And as you know, eugenics is a civil science uh, that proposes um, ways to improve a race or a human group. And these methods include the elimination of individuals through different methods, including castration, for instance. And all these theories that were enacted, that were that began to, to be developed at that time, then uh, were implemented in the in the 1930s by Hitler. Uh, but they were, they were not his own idea. These were all things that existed prior to Nazism and that existed, were being developed exactly, precisely at the same time that Adul Baha was visiting the West. So one is racial segregation, the implementation of eugenic law, laws and techniques, imperialism, colonialism. These are all social, uh, social consequences of this moral framework, conceptual framework, and this definition of human nature. Of course, another consequence of this definition of human nature is, was the belief that women are inferior uh, than men, and that therefore they shouldn't have the same rights as men. So, so that was another social consequence. Uh, the subjugation of women and the, the and depriving them of the same rights as men. So against all this background, as I mentioned before, Abdul Baha visited the West. He gave talks in several universities in the West, in, in Oxford, in the Stanford University, in Columbia University, among others. He spoke from the pulpits of more than 40 churches. He spoke from the platforms of several different organizations, the peace movement, the civil rights movement, uh, the suffrage movement, different feminist organizations in Europe and in North America. He has spoke for the socialists. He has spoke also for Christians, Muslims, for Jews, for Buddhists, for Hindus, for Zoroastrians. He met and spoke for, for many kinds of people and for many different groups. And a common feature of most of these talks is his attempt to substitute the prevalent conceptual framework that existed at that time with a new one, which was presented by Baha'u'llah and which has completely different features from the one I have just presented. From the Baha'i point of view, according to the Baha'i writings, it is not our body or material dimension that determines our identity, uh, that determines our emotions or intelligence or religiosity or morals or ethics. 
but an immaterial dimension in the human being, which is the soul or the spirit. The Baha'i writings say that it is the spirit, the human spirit, and not the body, that constitutes the essence of a human being. And therefore, it is this essence that constitutes our identity of primordial identity and not any accidental material circumstance such as a, or place or place of birth or gender or the color of his, or his skin, etc. So with this idea, uh, the Baha'i writings, for instance, uh, Baha'u'llah in one of his writings says, Now ye not why we created you all from the same dust, that no one should exalt himself over other. You are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Deal ye not, deal ye one with another with the utmost love and harmony, with friendliness and fellowship. So this is this is the idea, no? We have been all created, sharing a common essence, a common in material dimension, which is a human spirit. And because of this, we all members of the human kind, we are all one, regardless of any external difference or any accidental difference. This is very very important also considering the fact that at the time there were some scientists that even advocated the idea that different human races are actually different human species and that the blacks are one species the whites are one different species the uh, the asians are a different species and one of them one harvard harvard professor he even said that adam is the first man of the white race, but then the blacks have their own first man and the Asians have their own first man and so on. So some scientists at the time did not even accept that different races belong to the same species. They even go went as far as proposing that they are different species. So in this context, imagine Baha'u'llah was writing something completely different. We are all, we are all part of the same species because we share the same spiritual dimension. And it is this spiritual dimension that determines what we are and how we are. Following this idea, which was uh, very, much, uh, very much emphasized by Abdul Waha in his public talks, but also in his writings, comes the idea that all differences that we see in mankind which are based on any physical trait are just imaginary. For instance, Abdul Baha repeated in many of his talks that races do not exist, that they are just a human superstition and that there's nothing, no objective, objective truth such as race. He says, for instance, racial assumption and distinction, and distinction are nothing but superstition. God did not make these divisions. These distinctions have had their origin in man himself. Therefore, as they are against the plan and purpose of reality, they are false and imaginary. So this is now something which is accepted by modern science after our DNA has been decodified and, and we know that there's no single gene that uh, belongs to a particular race and because of the other reasons uh, modern science has agreed that races do not exist. But Abdul Baha was saying the same thing 110 years ago in a very much racist environment. Uh, so he was saying something completely different from his uh, contemporaries. And following this idea that our identity or human nature depends on a spiritual dimension or not on our material dimension, and that therefore we are all the or one, mankind is one, we are all equal, comes the idea that our capacity depends not on our biology, but on our education. 
or capacity depends on the education we receive. And here Abdul Baha mis, makes a distinction between two different kinds of education. One he says is material education, which is education in the sciences, in, in languages, etc. Another one is education, a spiritual education, which is an education in morals and in spirituality. So he says that when human beings are given both types of education, we can easily see that we are all the same and that there are no inferior or superior humans. He gives this example, for instance, in talking about gender equality. He says that women have been, historically, have been deprived of the right of education. And it is for this reason that uh, they are in a situation of inferiority just because they didn't have the same opportunities as men. And then he goes to say uh, to his audiences back then that if women were given the same education as men, we would soon see how they are, how women are equally intelligent as men and equally cap capable of doing the same things as men do. And as a matter of fact, he himself uh, sponsored and and led the establishment of several schools for women in Persia, in a Muslim country at that time. Uh, and in a brief span of time, a generation of girls uh, appeared in the country that were able to read, to write, that were competent in sciences and in other branches of knowledge, and which rapidly were taking advantage of their knowledge to to show to mankind uh, how women and men are equal. And he also gave the same example in talking about racial differences. He said that the, the differences between different racial groups are not the consequence of any natural or biological circumstance. They are just the consequence of different social and educational opportunities. And he gives a very clear example, he says, Go and see the blacks in Washington. They are lawyers, they are writers, they are, they, they are university professors. And then go and see the blacks in Central Africa. They are cannibals, they are savages. Uh, what is the difference between them? They belong to the same race, but of course the social progress is very different. What is the difference? Simply that the ones in Washington received education and the ones in Central Africa did not receive education. So for, for Abdul Baha, and this is also another thing he emphasized very much in his talks. For Abdul Baha, it is not our physical nature that determines our capacities, but it is the education we have received, the educational opportunities we have received that determine our capacities. But remember, not only material education, but also the spiritual education. If we are good or bad people, if we are honest, honest people or liars, that, that does not depend on our race or biology or body. That depends on the spiritual education we have received, whether we have been taught in honesty or whether we have not. Then next to this idea, sorry that I repeat all the ideas once and again, but it's the, the best way to convey them. So next to these ideas that, or as that, we are determined by our soul nor our body, that this soul is our essence and is shared by all mankind, therefore we are one, and that our capacities depend on our education, not on our natural circumstances, biological circumstances. Following to this comes the idea that society should be organized along these lines, that is, there should be no discrimination of any human being because of his or her race, gender, or nationality. All mankind is one. Therefore, all members of the human race should enjoy the same rights and prerogatives. And these men at that time advocating uh, racial integration he very much defended inter integrated meetings, for instance, in the United States. Uh, when Sometimes when he was invited to a place to give a presentation, he would request his host to allow Blacks to attend the meeting. Sometimes that was his condition. 
in some of the cities he visited. And it is very famous. Uh, there are some very famous newspapers accounts of that time showing how he expressed himself in favor of racial integration, even of racial intermarriages, sorry, sorry interracial marriages uh, that were forbidden in several states of the United States at that time. And how his presence influenced many people and one Chicago newspaper reported that in some of the houses of Washington, the hearts of some of the whites of the of the owners of those houses have been changed to that to to such an extent that now they open their houses to to the blacks as well. This was mentioned by a by the Chicago Defender, which was a black newspaper in Chicago published uh, published at that time. So so these were. So you see, the whole idea of what is human nature influences very much how we organize our societies and even how we conduct our own individual lives. At the time when uh, there was a firm belief in biological determination and in biological differences as the as the main force uh, dividing mankind, society was organized along those, li those lines, both at the domestic level and also at the global international level. And in a society that would follow along the lines that Abdul Baha proposed, uh, all mankind would see each other as one and at the domestic level there would be full equality between different members of society, regardless of their gender, race, or nationality, or culture, language, etc. And then the fifth and last feature difference between Abdul Baha's proposal, uh, proposal of a conceptual framework with that predominant at the time was his idea about uh, what is the motor behind uh, social progress. As I mentioned before, following social Darwinism, it was believed at the time that it is through competition and it is uh, through a strife that progress can be achieved, through conflict, that conflict brings progress. But Abdul Baha says that the, exactly the opposite is the truth, that progress and advancement comes not from conflict, but from cooperation and from friendliness and from unity. And he compares society with a, with a living being. Each cell in a living being is united to each other. As soon as they separate, uh, the living being dies, gets sick and dies. And same thing with any, any being. Whenever the atoms of any being separate, disintegrate, then that thing, that object disappears. Same thing is with society. He says it is unity and cooperation that bring forth progress and not conflict as it was believed. And just to finish my presentation and before I have the chance to answer your questions, if you have any, I want to share a summary of what I have said before, which will be more clear than my own words. So during the lifetime of Abdul Baha, it was believed in the West that human beings are primarily determined by biology. But Abdul Baha would say that human beings are primarily determined by the soul. People believed at the time that human progress is determined by natural factors. However, Abdul Baha would explain that human progress is determined by education, spiritual and material. Also, it was believed that human relations should be based in conflict on conflict and competition, while Abdul Baha would say that mankind's relations should be based on unity and cooperation. And before I finish my presentation, I want to bring your att attention to our present. And I see with much preoccupation how today science is again 
backing, defending a view on human nature, which is based on biological determination. As biological sciences are advancing, and for instance, the human uh, DNA is being decoded and read, more and more theories are uh, starting to be circulated in public opinion, saying that, for instance, such and such gene are responsible for emotions, and such and such gene are responsible for intelligence or for maths or for a capability of driving or for tendency to religiosity or any. I'm sure you have read read many all kinds of these news in the press over the last years. And also as uh, neurology is advancing in mapping the human brain and uh, unveiling the many mysteries that our brain we have here behind our eyes, also the same kind of theories are being circulated. In this side of, side of the brain, we have our religiosity. In this side of our brain, we have our morals. In here, we have love, whatever. And people who have not developed this part of their brain, they, are, they have a tendency to criminality or they have a tendency to be atheist or whatever. So now in the 21st century, we are again uh, we are again reading and hearing te new theories that go back to biological determinism. And these are very, very dangerous because next to it is the modern tendency to map or genetic, uh, or genetic, um, uh, how you say the word in English? Sorry, to map our genes to our to our race. You you have probably you have probably seen those very famous videos in which somebody is told that he has fourteen percent of Turkish and then twenty five percent of Russian and then uh, thirteen percent from Af African or whatever. This is this is this is done uh, on the basis of the idea that some genes are more predominant in some areas of the world. Now, imagine if that gene is said by some other scientist that precisely that gene affects our intelligence. That would mean that science would be stating that people of an area where that particular gene is more predominant are less intelligent than other people in other areas of the world. All these things are completely nonsense. Scientists do not believe in these things, or many scientists do not believe in these things, but they are entering into public opinion very rapidly. And soon I fear we will see again these discourses saying that some peoples in the world because of a particular gene or a particular way of de developing some side of the brain, they have a tendency towards something, whereas people in other parts of the world don't have it. And from this, new laws and new social measures can be implemented. And it is a real danger that we may face if we don't learn from the past. And if we don't accept that what defines us as human beings is not our body, but our soul, which is something immaterial and something that develops with the assistance of education. Thank you very much for your patience. My apologies for the technical problems <laughs> and for my strong Spanish accent. <laughs> It, that was a wonderful um, presentation and talk. I mean, thank you so much. I'm I'm going to go straight to one question that um, was put on chat while you were talking. It's a very interesting question. Maybe just one or two sentences in response. Is the belief that, for example, African Americans are inferior to white Americans problematic because it is a scientifically invalid invalid because the idea of race is scientifically invalid? 
or is it problematic because of our poor treatment and lack of compassion um, we have towards people who have differences that we view as bad? After all, in rejecting biological determinism, we can go to the other extreme and say that biological differences like genetics don't matter, and that's not true either. For example, genes predict educational and labor market outcomes to the same extent that social economic status does, meaning some people will have a harder time in school, in part due to their genetics, than other people. So is the issue that we don't, that, sorry, that we shouldn't use biology to define human differences, or is the issue more of the hierarchy we assign to biological differences? Thank you, Rebecca, for that question. If you can briefly answer. Yes. That, These that. are several questions. Yes. Uh, but before answering them, this, I will start with something else. The first thing we have to have into account is that there, there's nothing as a collective, collective gene. For instance, I'm from Barcelona. And tomorrow I could, in the subway, I could be sitting next to a person from Nairobi. And we could be, we could be genetically more near than I am with my white neighbor. Do you know what I mean? I mean, the fact that some uh, people, that we have different colors, we have different physiognomies, all these things, doesn't mean that we are that genetically different or that people of the same race are so genetically equal. We are, we are all different. Any human being is unique uh, genetically and emotionally and in all ways, we are all unique. And the problem, the first problem of uh, making this hierarchy and um, is that, so, so answering the first question, it is invalid because genetically there is no black race or no white race. Of course, there are people who have a gene that determines the color of the skin, but I may have that gene as well, despite the fact that I'm white. You know what I mean? It's modern science knows that. So again, two people of what we call races, two people of different races can be more close genetically than two people of the same race. So we cannot just say that this whole group of humans is genetically in this way and this whole group of humans is genetically on that way. So of course, uh, our biology influences, of course, our lives. Uh, this is on the animal. Um, but we shouldn't, or or primordial identity should, shouldn't be based on that. For instance, I may have born with a disease uh, that would affect my, I don't know, any, anything, anything in my body. And that would of course uh, affect my emotions and affect the way I live. That's, that's correct, that's right. And, and there's also some other biological features which are not diseases, are healthy features that can affect us in any different way. But that doesn't mean that I should base my primordial identity as human being, as a human being in that difference. The thing is that the truth is that we are very much, we are much more than what our body is telling us, what our genes are telling us. As a matter of fact, nationalism, racism, and sexism have as a common feature that they reduce uh, the human being, they reduce the individual to a very few uh, bodily features, whereas the individual is, is far above those very few things. We have intelligence, we have emotions, we have morals, we have ethics, we have values in our lives. We do serve others, uh, we have feelings. All these things are completely superior from the very few physical traits we can see in each other that differentiate us, right? So I always talking about nationalists, for instance, I always, 
I, I live in a region which is very, very, very nationalist. And I am in the wrong side because I'm a Spanish speaker. So, so I suffer that nationalism very much. It's kind of a racism. Uh, anyway, I always debate this with some of my nationalist friends. Imagine I'm, uh, imagine a teacher uh, who has a wife and two kids and is a Catholic who goes every Sunday to mass. He speaks Catalan, he likes the Catalan food and he supports Barcelona's football team. And his neighbor, he's in his 20s, he's a drug addict, he has been in prison and he's an atheist. And, but he also speaks Catalan, likes Catalan food and supports Barcelona's football team. Of course, they have some common features, uh, but we cannot consider them the same at all because their values and their circumstances are completely different. This teacher from Barcelona is much closer to a teacher in Madrid who is also a Catholic and who also has a wife and two kids than with his neighbor, despite the fact that they have they, they share some common national traits. Uh, so again, the problem with all these theories on human nature is that they reduce man, the individual to a very few things, gender, a few national traits, or a few bodily features. Whereas we as individuals, as human beings, we are much superior than all that. We have much, um, our richness completely goes beyond that. So any reductionist view of mankind, of the individual, is a problem in, in itself because it deprive us, deprives us from our true identity and our true self. Thank you, Amin. Um, it is eight o'clock. I'm happy um, to read out one more question. Um, I, I'm, I understand that some people may have to leave because we did say it would finish at eight. Just want to, before we, I read the last question, just want to thank Amin Agea um, again for his talk and very thought provoking and um, very interesting um, for, for the recent history and for um, helping us understand the voice that Abdul Baha had at that time. Um, in fact, there is another talk later on the 10th of um, December, which covers Abdul Baha and his journey in America. But there are many talks before then as well. So please um, look at the list of talks. These will be sent to everybody in an email and the, um, the link to the YouTube recording of this talk and an email address if you have any um, questions. I'm going to read out Zinzan's question, which I think is very thought provoking, even if you have to leave and you don't hear Amin's um, response. He says, thank you so much, Amin, for your talk. What actions and practical steps do you think we can take to work towards unity and cooperation? It seems like an inspirational vision to work towards and one that is deeply needed in society today. But where and how can we begin to take steps? Yeah, I will answer that one. But let me first answer the one before, <laughs> the, the one after. Oh, sorry. sorry. Yes. <laughs> it says that the thinking about the superiority of certain races was not evidence based. Well, it, for, the, for the scientists at the time, it was evidence based they would take measures of the skulls of the people from different races and they would uh, they this harvard professor that i mentioned before he had a huge collection of human heads in his uh, office in harvard at harvard university he had like 700 or 900 skulls of coming from all different parts of the world and he would measure them and make all kinds of studies of them just to prove that that some uh, races are superior to others, more intelligent to others, because the, there was the belief that the size of your head uh, is correlated to your to your intelligence. So he would say, see, these people from this country, their heads are smaller, therefore they are less intelligent. And also they will say that uh, if your skull is has some traits of the apes, uh, like uh, bigger brows or things like this, then you are less developed than other um, races that don't have these features. 
So for the science of the time, it was evidence-based and there's much writing, scientific writing about that. And regarding this question about what, what are the steps, well, there are many steps that's worth another talk, actually, another presentation. But I would say uh, that following uh, the, the person of the figure of Abdul Baha, uh, he, would, he would work on different levels. One level was education, very important, educating peoples from childhood to adulthood in, in these ideas, inviting them to reflect about what's, what's a human being and what are, the social con, what are the social consequences of this and how society should be organized. But he, it is very interesting that he also educated through his own example. And he also used the Baha'i community, both in the East and in the West as laboratories where these ideas were implemented and where people could look and see uh, the social implications of what he was saying and also see that these were not mere utopias or ideas, abstract ideas, but that they were things that could actually uh, put into practice. And for instance, as I mentioned at the beginning, he led the establishment of many schools for girls in, in Persia. In some cities, the Baha'i schools for girls were the first schools ever existed, existing in those cities. And this enacted a series of transformations, social transformations that allowed the rest of the Persian society to see some of the implications of the Baha'i principle of equality between men and women. Or in the West, he educated with his own example and also with his words, the Baha'i, the North American Baha'i community in racial integration. And in a few years, um, the Baha'i community was transformed into a racially integrated community with meetings open to all races, with interracial marriages. And all of a sudden, the American society could see in a living body, as the American Baha'i community was, could see what were the implications of what he was saying. So it is through education, but also th through action that these things should be implemented. Always with the speed of learning, because as circumstances change, change also our understanding of some principles also change. Sorry for extension of my answer. I think um, it's now six minutes past eight. I mean, I, you, you've yes. obviously, um, stimulated a lot of um, thoughts and ideas and questions and um, it's a uh, yeah it's it's an amazing um, interesting topic and very obviously um, relevant to our times as well as you as you've explained um, so we can't hear a round of applause but thank thank you very much for sharing your time and your insights and as i've explained there will be a final slide with some details and um everybody who signed up through eventbrite will receive a following email with further details um these are for the next um six fridays so the next one is next friday there will be um, other talks covering different subjects and especially on the 26th of November, which is the eve of the centenary of the passing of Abdul Baha, there is a, a story and um, that's being told by Ishmael Velesco. Um, so, and Wendy Momin, as you can see, is covering the topic of advancement of women. So this will also, it, it, it probably overlaps a little bit with Amin's talk as well. So please have a look at the, 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 the up and coming talks to see if there are more that you would be interested in, or if you know other people that would be interested in. Thank you once again, and thank you everybody um, for joining us this evening and hope to see you next week. Thank you.